guys, Kelly Link here, host and interviewer for video game events and tournaments around the world. And in this series, we're going to be exploring esports. If I had, you know, a dollar for every time I was at an airport. So what are you doing? And I'm like, oh, I'm going to a tournament. Oh, what kind of a tournament? I'm like, it's a video game tournament. You make money playing video games? Players who participate in esports are getting paid like professional athletes. They train like professional athletes. It's a different style of competing. Kids can grow up knowing that they can make money playing these video games. In a growing scene, there are growing opportunities, and the esports industry is expected to reach a billion dollars in the year 2020. But it's not just the pros who will reap the benefits. We got to talk to business owners, organizers of teams, and entertainers, and we saw why there are a million reasons to play. Hi, my name is Doug Sensor Martin. I'm a competitive Call of Duty player and a FaZe Clan content creator. Sensor has been in the competitive esports scene since 2011 and has won over a quarter of a million dollars playing Call of Duty. He's also a member of FaZe Clan, which is one of the most popular esports organizations in the world. So Call of Duty, that was the game that you became professional in. When did you go from it being kind of a passion to your profession? When we were growing up as kids, this wasn't a career path. I even won the national championship, which was the most money you can make in a tournament at the time. And I didn't even think it was gonna be a career. I stopped playing and I went to college. But clearly, you're back at it again. What happened? I saw Call of Duty announcing million dollar tournaments and, and I was like, wow. I told my mom, I was like, listen, I'm gonna stop going to college for this next year. I'm gonna focus all on video games. I'm gonna try to make this a career. I just felt like I could win and I felt like I had a good message that I could share to people. You've been playing since 09 and 10. How are they, like, what, how do you see it changing? How do you see, like, A the lot better. It's yeah. a lot better now. I mean, first of all, that even four years ago, when I was winning championships, I wasn't making a salary. Now right. these guys are making $100,000 a year in salary. There's so much more money to be made in these tournaments. There's so many more people watching it. There's actual career paths that can be taken in streaming, uh, YouTube gaming. I make YouTube videos, I live stream. I went from competitive player to a YouTuber, back to a competitive player, back to a YouTuber. I was in Sharknado. I don't even know what the hell I am anymore, man. You were in Sharknado? I was the helicopter pilot in Sharknado. <laughs> Stop it! That's me! That's me right there! That's my face! So you've been in this industry already for a decade. What about the next decade? If yeah. something's not broken, why would I want to fix it? I love Fair my enough. life. I, I have my two beautiful dogs. Family lives right next to me. I live in the area that I love. I've traveled in so many places because of this, this job. Competitive gaming is a lot of work. It takes a lot of time, a lot of preparation, a lot of sacrifice, and it's one of the best feelings when you can win. The big business of video games, 14-year-old Griffin Spakovsky, known by his gaming moniker, Skeptic, earned $200,000 playing the video game Fortnite. Skeptic is a 14-year-old Fortnite player who is already making huge waves in the esports community. I qualified for the World Cup, so I get to go to New York City and compete there for uh, $30 million. Dude! Oh my gosh, I think I just broke my desk, dude. Oh, oh my message gosh, you? Sundown messaged me and said I just, we just qualified. Do you know what the prize pool is for the World Cup? It's $15 million for duos, $15 million for solos. 30 million. I know that they said that they were going to invest $100 million into their first year of esports, but it's just crazy to think 30 million in one tournament where Dota is at 25 million. And yeah. Dota's been around for a decade. Oh, yeah. Here comes Fortnite saying, nope, $100 million. That's what we're going to invest into it. How do you think that's impacting the game? A lot more people are playing, I think, because they want to win this money. I think the competitive players get more excited and a lot more like competitive grind is into it. Do you have any concerns going into the World Cup? Kind of nervous because like there's a lot of other top tier players. Yeah. So it's definitely going to be a challenge. Over the last course of a year, I've made upwards of around $300,000 over playing Fortnite. Not only do I make money from competing, I also make money through streaming on Twitch, Caffeine, and making YouTube videos daily. Hey guys, it's Jeff. There are a million reasons to go pro or go into a career in esports, but of course, number one is uh, money. There's so much advertising, dollars being funneled into esports, and that 13 to 21 age group, that is the impressionable generation. Brands are throwing their money there. Kids can grow up knowing that they can make money playing these video games. That is how the pros are getting paid. Of course, streaming is an incredible option. They can just start on their own with platforms like Twitch, and it's not easy, but there is that ability to believe that without being a pro, you can make a living. Players Lounge is a platform that lets gamers from all around the world challenge each other for cash prizes. So you don't need to be a pro to make money from all of your favorite games. The idea behind the platform is that we can offer esports competitions to anyone in the world from the comfort of their own home. Even if you're playing a $10 Madden game or a $50 or $100 Madden game, 
the money's important, but what's really there is like the rush, how alive it feels to play and be in last zone with like a dollar on the line. But I would say the average uh, gamer on Players Lounge is uh, paying like a $10 entry fee and winning like around $20 at a time. So here we have the matchmaking area. You can either play in a $1 room, $5 room, or a free room. And what are the things here? We have a, a chat for people to communicate together. Correct, so this is where people can find opponents to play custom games against. And in a custom game, you can send a challenge to somebody for anywhere between $5 or $500. I think what the Players Lounge is doing for the community is really cool. There's a lot of players out there that can't travel to these, uh, not even international events, but to just local tournaments because they have full-time jobs or maybe they have families to take care of. So the fact that there's this place online where they can hone their skills, have a community to play with, and also earn some money is really cool. So we're going to be talking with pros, YouTubers, streamers to see if they think esports is a real sport. From like an endurance perspective, absolutely a sport. It's at a high enough level where I would say, all right, if you think that this is so easy, then do it. Just like regular sports, you have strategies. You tell one person to go one direction. You tell the other guy to hold down this other guy. The kids want to go see the Giants or the Jets or anyone like that. Of course, I think esports could actually end up being just as big as any other sport. You know, they, they are considered professional athletes. This is, now I've watched, this is, my this sons is, are diehard video I mean, game players. Probably parents is going to shock they parents, but the run, ship, they the can't ship jump, is sailed. They can't do nothing. <laughs> this is good news. This is good news. From like an endurance perspective, absolutely a sport. If you can say like chess is a sport or something like that, you're, it's all thinking. You know what I mean? You're just trying to outthink your opponent. It's at a high enough level where I would say, all right, if you think that this is so easy, then do it. As a traditional sports enthusiast, I'm gonna go ahead and say that esports is not a sport. Hey everyone, this is Giuseppe Guastella, AKA the Godfather. I am the esports FIFA player for the LA Galaxy and represent the US Soccer Federation. Here from the Godfather, Ibrahimovic able to find Messi out what? Oh. Yanni! There it is! There it is! One nil for the Godfather! What are some things that preparing for an esports tournament or even just becoming a pro player that people that aren't gamers would think of? You have to know like the ins and outs of the game, the actual like physics and how the players move. You actually have to know which player to use at a certain position, when to move up your attacking. You have to understand soccer. So when did sports franchises start becoming invested into esports? So the MLS wanted to start an actual league called the EMLS which brought these clubs, like the Galaxy, to have a one representative to represent the club. And I'm one of the top players in the United States. I'm based in LA, so it was a perfect fit for the Galaxy and I to join the EMLS. You know, we have this really interesting juxtaposition of gaming and esports. Do you think esports is a real sport? I'm gonna be the bad guy on this. I don't think esports is a sport. I could be 50 years old, and I could be one of the best players in the world. For me, it's sitting down in a chair mm -hmm. and moving your fingers. Mentally, it's there, but for it to be a sport, it has to be physically and mentally there. Esport, sport, it, it doesn't matter. The, the generation now, instead of watching sports, they're watching these tournaments, they're watching us play. It doesn't matter if it's called an actual sport. Esports is fine. It, it takes as much mus muscle memory or muscles, period, as much as any other sport. Just like regular sports, you have strategies. You tell one person to go one direction. You tell the other guy to hold down this other guy. But if you have an audience and you have people who, for whatever they're doing, stop the doing in the middle of their day to look at a screen, that's a sport. Who cares? Why do, do we have to have that debate again? It is just people coming together and having fun. And as long as it's making people happy, who cares if it's a sport? Hey guys, it's Jeff. A lot of people are asking, is eSports a sport? Well, think about it. It includes hand-eye coordination, body preparation, and it is a competition. We consider shooting a sport, curling, NASCAR. What's the difference, really, between pushing a pedal and using the controller? Now, there's another side to this question. Does eSports care about being a sport? And I actually don't think so. You look at the college level. Frankly, collegiate esports have a chance to correct wrongs made by the NCAA and create their own vertical on college campuses. On college campuses, there's a discussion now between the athletic departments, 
and the esports clubs of how to make this. Should we make this a sport? I don't think you need to be the most athletic person, but I do believe it is a sport because of the mental capacity that's necessary at that point. I think what most people don't recognize who aren't in esports is that it's not like, oh, a bunch of guys just playing video games. Yeah, your thumbs really have to move fast, but your brain has to move oh, just as quick yeah. because all every times. single person knows every single thing about the game. I'm a big golfer, but what's mm -hmm. different than golf, really? With esports, I mean, when you think about what you're doing with your hands, mm -hmm. with your brain. If you consider chess to be a sport or poker to be a sport, then esports is 100% one. Also, yeah. we get really sweaty, or I get really sweaty. Oh. <laughs> I can't speak for you, but I get really sweaty yeah. when I'm playing competitive. Right. Trust me, I interview some of these NBA 2K League guys after games. They're soaked in sweat. <laughs> <laughs> That's the other thing. Like, it's a gladiator sport, so you have to earn every single thing that you get. It's not like you can be the 12th best man in the NBA on the team and you're gonna get a championship ring and you have a guaranteed salary. You can make zero dollars and play the entire year competitively. It depends on your success. So that mindset is entirely different when you have one of the best players across from you and you're thinking like, I gotta kill for my food here. I think esports could actually end up being just as big as any other sport. First off, the target demographic is younger. Kids want to go see the Giants or the Jets or anyone like that, of course, but they yeah. don't get to see Tom Brady as often as they could see anyone on YouTube or yeah. Twitch. That connection that they would have to that professional is just incredible. It's growing so rapidly. I mean, honestly, the sky is the limit for where these things can actually go. Well, something that a lot of players don't know, or a lot of fans don't know about in esports is that they have coaches. It's incredible. Yeah. They know all the players. They have everything locked down. They've also watched hours and hours of game yeah. film on the yeah. team that they're playing. Tell people someone it's not a sport at that point. So, did we ever find out, is eSports a real sport? Well, we asked a dozen different people and we got a dozen different answers. But between established organizations, sold out tournaments, and franchising around the world, it's hard to deny the similarities. This is a bigger industry than music and movies and television. From land centers to local grassroots events to the major international sold out stadiums, esports tournaments are everywhere. We're going to see every level of competition and what exactly goes into a tournament. Clearly, the audience is there. They have no problem getting people to fly out. They have no problem getting people to be invested for a spectator standpoint. People don't understand that people enjoy watching other people play video games. Video game tournaments come in every shape and size. From local small grassroots events to sold out international stadiums, one thing remains the same, the desire to be the best. In this episode, we got to see not only what it takes to perform in a tournament, but also to run one. My name is Danny Harvath. I am Director of Business Development at Nerd Street Gamers. It's an eSports facility right here in Northern Liberties, Philly. We're here for a national championship series, $2,500 up for grabs. We're all about providing competitive opportunities and eSports facilities, venues for the amateur competitor. Kids see the pro leagues going on and want to know how do they get to that point? Where do they go to compete? We provide that avenue for amateur growth. This tournament right now is being broadcast live on Twitch. In in terms of the operations of the event and the broadcast, there's a lot of production going on in the back room right now. Talent that includes casters and analysts. There's also tournament admins directing the event and helping guide teams through the brackets. There's a lot going on. My name is Griffin Landisberg. I am a technical director here at Nerd Street Gamers. That means I produce the broadcasts and the streams for all of the tournaments and events that we run. For every broadcast, this, this standard pieces that need to go into it. You have to have commentators, you have to have lights, camera. You have the observer, which is essentially the in-game cameraman. Higher level productions, we might have a team of four to five observers that are all in the same game, capturing different camera angles in case we want to pull like a certain replay or a certain angle that we didn't capture beforehand. Counter-Strike's a very fast-paced game, so when a crazy clip happens, you need to be able to say, all right, let's bring that in and then replay it for the stream within 10 seconds. I'm Mike Darf, Mike Winnick. I'm a Counter-Strike caster, so I do commentary for matches, tournaments like this. If you're passionate about esports, one of the important things you can do is find your niche. It's a medium that really suits me and what I love to do, which is just being able to share things that I'm passionate about and excited about and really tell a story and help to build that narrative for people. People don't understand that people enjoy watching other people play video games. When you see the intensity of the players competing and the energy around it, that's what it takes a lot of times for people to really get it. Hey everyone, Kelly Link here and I am at Thunder Smash. It is a Smash Brothers tournament run by Thunder Gaming. I mean, you can feel the intensity going on right now. There's a lot of hype from the audience, but the most intense part about this event is that it is winner takes all $20,000 only going to one person. 
I started running tournaments when I was 15 years old. I was a kid with a clipboard and his mom's laptop at his mom's house running house tournaments. I didn't go into the scene and say to myself, oh yeah, I'm gonna become a commentator. I did lifestyle talk shows and I was a weather guy for a while. I did sports. I talked to the director of uh, eSports to say, hey, I would love to do some live broadcast work and he gave me a chance. And then from there, I've gotten to work great events like CEO, Evo for the last couple years and have been just trying to grow from that. I had an opportunity to cover the League of Legends World Championships for ESPN. So after that, I said, you know, now that I realize that this is something that I can pursue, uh, I want this to be what I go after. I actually didn't know the competitive scene existed until roughly 2015 um, when I had met a classmate of mine with a Smash shirt on. They're like, yeah, I just came back from Apex. And I was like, Apex, what is that? Back in 2016, the dawning of that grassroots Smash Brothers community that everybody knows started when I was a freshman in college. We were all just teenagers playing Smash Brothers because we enjoyed playing Smash Brothers. And then money got involved and we realized that this could be something really cool. For someone like myself, the prospect of being able to cast events, like we're here at Thunder Smash, right? And this has the biggest first place prize in Smash history, which is unbelievable. I love to sit at a desk with people who are experts of the game and get the best conversation possible. If you have monitors and you have switches, the entire Smash community can already offer their talent. There's people who've been running tournaments for decades already in the scene, content producers, commentators or casters, doing all the things that you would think you would need to find people or train people, you don't have to. You just need to have people who are passionate enough and guess what, they're everywhere here. Hey guys, it's Jeff. There's a big difference between competing on your couch and actually competing at a tournament or event. You have people from all over the world who maybe aren't playing just show up because they want that energy of being in the same place watching the best in the world compete on the same screen. There is a crowd and yes, they do influence the competition. If you hear the crowd howl behind you, you're going to react. It's something that you will never get in person on your couch just with your friends. These are strangers, people you don't know cheering for you or against you. It is a legitimate component of the game. Anything that would be related to sports or to entertainment really has a place within esports. Anything that would be related to management, um, in terms of like team management, organization management, there's a million different ways you can get interested. So much goes into making a video game, running an esports team, or organizing an international tournament. And in this episode, we only scratch the surface. League of Legends, NBA 2K, and Super Smash Brothers. We've all played the games, and we've all seen the tournaments, but how exactly does this happen? In this episode of Exploring Esports, we'll go behind the scenes and see the people that make it all come true. What are some like some aspects about running an organization in esports that maybe people outside of gaming would have never expected. Just like any other business, like every single role has to be there. Someone has to handle the money, so you need finances. Someone has to be there for PR, marketing. You need someone that's gonna be a general manager. Someone, business development, uh, you know, sponsorships. Uh, someone's gotta help with technology and everything. Everything that you see in a, any sort of traditional business, you're gonna see in esports, because at the end of the day, esports, uh, most of those businesses are just like everyone else. They have to run just like them. What other positions are there in esports that people only really assume, it's oh, you're either a pro player or you're like a commentator. You're in a track for legal HR finance and reach out to an esports company. They're all growing really fast right now because new teams and new franchises, they need people. Um, esports is also a lot of production, right? Like putting on an event is, a, is, a, is an affair. There's broadcasting, there's lighting, there's camera work, um, and all these like pieces that exist in the world of production also exist in esports and is also a little bit specialized in esports. So not only is that production job as relevant in gaming as it is in music or film or TV, um, it's a little bit specialized, so it requires an extra understanding of what it is of the medium, right? And so like if you have that specialized skill, then like that makes you valuable. It is an industry. It's absolutely an industry. It has an economy yeah. and, it, and it has a workforce and it's growing. Yeah, not even just gaming, but esports mm -hmm. itself has, is an industry, mm -hmm. almost mm -hmm. billion dollar industry right now. Mm -hmm. Tell me a little bit about the people that you've gotten to work with over the years, outside of the players. So for team management, um, one of the people that we have on staff, she is essentially responsible for everything, ranging from managing the content creators, double checking to make sure that people are meeting their stream hours, organizing the logistics when we still had a pro team at the time to compete in Europe, to compete in China. Without that level of support, without that buffer zone, because 
when you're 19, 20, 23, 24, 25, and you've got the entire world watching you, you have businesses trying to get a hold of you, you have your own brand to protect, and this is a real, like the space is certainly maturing, but it's still in its infancy. Just having a little bit of a reliance and someone that you can trust and buffer for you so that you can go back and make the right decision for you, I think is crucial. And for those people behind the scenes, be them managers, organizers, people that run the logistics, their positions are invaluable and most of the time you'll never see their face. The esports realm is kind of a, a wild west right now. So anyone that has a grip, um, that knows what they're doing, there's, there's business for you. So that's what we supply and that's what I'm doing right now. There's production, there's art design around it, there's people working in sales and marketing and the business side of things. You know, there's people who do what I do, who broadcast, there's the people who help me do what I do. And again, in production and in, in, in I mean, in things as varied as like hair and makeup to just like setting up studio spaces, people who build stages. There's a million different ways. So the name of the game is uh, Pro Sports Gaming, uh, acronym for PSG Football. We start with football because this is the sport that we know the best, especially in terms of the whole esports and video game world. The first thing that sparked this game was in 2011 when we first wanted to get into business together in general. Um, Lamont stayed at my place for a summer. He just kept telling me every single day, like, let's. Let's start a gaming business, let's start a gaming business. The best ideas come from the gamers because they're the ones on it 24 seven. In about three, four months, we got a tremendous amount done in terms of having a teaser ready for the game, uh, the coding developed already, the animations, I mean, top notch motion capture, things of that nature. You can also customize your character with a lot of crazy outfits, some fancy hair, helmets, and who knows, just tons of stuff. So um, yeah, you have the 11 on 11 where each person represents their own position. Uh, that forces people to work with each other in a way that's never been done before because traditionally it's always been one versus one. By us having 11 on 11, you're really gonna have a hard time taking advantage of a real person and doing the same thing over and over again. But one day we're also gonna do some other titles mm -hmm. such as basketball, soccer, tennis, who knows? Mm -hmm. So you can have that same type of PSG concept, PSG soccer, PSG tennis, go for lots of things. Hey, it's Jeff. Let's go behind the controller. You know, a lot of people think these tournaments, maybe they're just one system, throw up a couple monitors and that's it. But there's so much beyond that. There's a whole group that goes into that. And it's not just the people doing the actual video production, but then the people actually producing the game itself. Many times you have the game developers actually on site because they're creating a custom form of the game for that particular esport. That might mean different outfits, different attributes. You might be able to get this in the store, but the professionals are actually playing at this high of a level just to even the playing field. I, I realized that, that, that I might have been. Yeah, like, yeah. Did I hit the mic? Yeah. And we get to check out why the community, my hair keeps going right into my mouth. <laughs> That's my fake laugh. It's really bad. You make money playing video games? It's a different style of competing. If you can say like chess is a sport or something like that, you're, it's all thinking. You know what I mean? You're just trying to outthink your opponent. Esport, sport, it, it doesn't matter. The, the generation now, instead of watching sports, they're watching these tournaments, they're watching us play. It doesn't matter if it's called an actual sport, esports is fine. It is just people coming together and having fun, and as long as it's making people happy, who cares if it's a sport? <laughs>